the way you know you're being successful? We measure it on different levels. One of the ways is we see that things are being done differently and think people are thinking differently about who they're working with and how they're working towards something. So that's on the kind of a macro level. So for example, when we can get a local government um, who's perhaps politically inclined in one direction to work with uh, a corporation and community members and perhaps they all perceive to have different interests um, and different needs, perhaps the community needs, they don't feel like anyone's really listening and the government might have some political agenda and the private sector is just trying to do business and trying to be successful. And when we're able to kind of find an overlap be across all these different um, measures of, of what's success and what's needed, that's really interesting because then we're able to really change dialogue and change change systems and change the way things are done either at a municipal level or even at a ministry level in some of the countries that we work in. Now, what that means on a micro level, what that means on a human level, is when we're trying, when we're working with young people, we're working in the most violent region in the world. Uh, we have the highest homicides rates in the in in the world in, in Central America. And what that means for us, what success means for us on a human level, is that we're able to make sure that we do it as much as we can with working with the public system to try to keep kids out of violence um, and help them thrive. So we need to make sure that we're providing them with opportunities. Again, bringing back resources from different from different sectors and leveraging these partnerships. But, but what it means for, for me is that a 14-year-old boy is not going to join the gang or get killed. Um, and what it means for me is that a, you know, 16, 15 year old girl isn't going to be pregnant with her second child because, you know, as a result of violence. So there's success on different levels. And for us, we need to change the system to also change the human level. We have a, I'll give one example that's been really interesting. Uh, we have one, we work with Haynes Brands. Haynes Brands is a company that works in several companies and they manufacture t-shirts and they're, they're, they manufacture socks. It's a huge multinational company. And we actually started working with them about eight years ago that when they said, you know, we want to invest in our community that at that point it was more philanthropic. How do we invest in the communities around us? Uh, and they approached us. And luckily, most of our partnerships, they'll allow us to provide that kind of ad advising or uh, trying to really design a program that, that we believe generates impact. So what we did was we were able to do, we do an, an asset, we do like an, a resources assessment as opposed to a needs assessment. We identify what the community around, not just the employees, but also the communities around where that company operates, what their priorities are. And we start there and we start with what their resources are as opposed to what their needs are. So that was a really, that's a really interesting difference in our approach because if we start with needs, we start with a deficiencies base. So for us, it was really important to say, what are the resources? What do you have here? And when we start identifying the public schools and the public health facilities and the public resources, we, we see that there's a lot of infrastructure resources and there's interesting convening power. So since then, we've been working with this company in about six or eight different public schools. We work in the communities surrounding the schools. We've been able to reduce the dropout rate, the kids that are in the programs. We provide after-school programming. We've reduced the dropout rate. Kids in our programs are three to four times less likely to drop out. They operate in very high risk area. And the graduation rates have gone up. We've improved the infrastructure. And the really interesting part of it is that the employees of that company have been involved throughout. They, regardless of their educational levels, because some of them have lower educational level, primary school, their employees have been involved throughout the whole process, volunteering in the schools to lead programs, educational and enrichment programs for the students there. So the company's now not only been awarded several uh, prestigious recognitions, but also they feel much more integrated with the communities they operate in, and they've also been able to see over six, seven years what the difference is in those communities and how these kids are really uh, being provided with opportunities that keep them away from the many risks that we face. Communities we're working with, with Haynes and with the public sector, particularly with the public education system, are located outside San Salvador in a region in three or four different municipalities that are high risk. They have high rates of violence and San Pedro Sula, also a city in Honduras with very high rates of violence. So they're, they're very challenging communities to work in. However, most of their employees come from those communities, so it's been really 
it's been a really interesting and long-term success story that the employees are basically engaged in the communities they come from and in the schools where, they're, where, they're, where their kids go to school. So it's something that, that's a value generator for everybody and that starts from, from a resource base, like what, how can we leverage people, uh, not just financial resources and school infrastructure, but how do we leverage people too, uh, which, is, which is really important for cohesion in general. What I expect from the region as a chronic optimist, which I think we have to be uh, when we're working in, in these spaces, I really believe it's going to improve. And I, and I say that coming off of we just had a regional youth festival a few weeks ago. and We had 10,000 young people from rival gang areas from the region in one space, and we had not one incident of violence. So I, I really think... Um, Unfortunately, we're at such a challenging point with the rates of violence and the rates of homicide that there's that it has to get better. And I and I think the way we do that is we we definitely build these partnerships and we invest in in children and young people in a way that provides them with the opportunities for them to really drive their own development and make sure that they're able to to thrive in these contexts in spite of the trauma and the adversity that they're facing on a daily basis in their communities and their homes. Uh, and in the country in general, and the stigma that there is around around young people around the world, I think that the stigma that there is around young Central American men and women. The way to make these partnerships work across sectors, and, and the challenge, because it is challenging in heavily polarized countries and regions, and it's finding, it's, it's bringing it to a very basic level of, of of empathy in order to find collaboration and I think of really good communication. And given that the Glasswing operates in the nonprofit sector, um, and we've been very careful over the 10 years that we've existed to, to not take any partisan uh, role in any way, we're able to almost broker the different interests in a way that maintains community and human, human development priorities as the basis for, for, for these partnerships. So, so we're able to focus on what the priorities are at a community level and then bring other stakeholders, bring government around. And like I said, a lot of times, they're really, they do not get along, they have no relationship or they have an antagonistic relationship. And I, I think there's something to say for being an independent actor um, where you're not perceived as someone who's looking out for, for a particular interest, but really looking out for the interests of the population that's living in the community that you're working with, I think women, children, families, and then trying to find a way. And one of the, you know, one of the ways that we've been most successful at it is volunteerism, actually. And a lot of times we'll have people who have never interacted because of political reasons or because of just different interests, and we'll have these big projects where we address some issue in a public school, we build a classroom or we fix or we equip. And it's interesting how a volunteer project of a couple hundred people and you really strategically invite people who normally do not do not get along and how volunteerism has been a really, really important vehicle for us for social cohesion and for communication and breaking down some of these trust barriers between, between government and, and private sector government and community and these different players. I think issues of transparency in that process are really important and I, I, I believe that if you're able to bring up not only identify common ground but really start trying to work with advising it if I were advising a governor really start working on transparency in general in approaching issues in disagreeing about issues and it's okay establishing more of a transparent dialogue um, and, and, and in the process identifying ways to get to get common ground. I think there's definitely, in Latin America right now, there's definitely more accountability from this kind of ciudadanía, the, the civil society side. And, and we're demanding as civil society, and I count myself in that, we're demanding more transparency and we're, we're actually really supportive, um, you know, we're supportive of some of these processes that are going that are happening right now. A lot of government officials, uh, business businesses, a lot of people are are being uh, investigated and they're being held accountable. And I, I, you know, I believe that even though sometimes it, you know, some people don't agree with with investigations and who's being who's being accused of what. I believe that it's a really important process. I think it's really good for the region. I think it helps when it starts in one country, um, Guatemala. Uh, 
is a is a great example, and that actually spurs other countries to to start doing the same. And and the U.S. government has also been uh, uh, very supportive of transparency objectives in general. I'm optimistic because I do think that's happening. I'm also optimistic um, because I see that things are changing. I see that there's more innovation, and I think that we're being more creative about the way we problem solve and more collaborative. So I think that that's a the, tr the addressing transparency is absolutely fundamental if you're going to build collaboration because you can't you can't build collaboration without a base of trust. So I think they really go hand in hand, and I and I think in a region with such a history of of corruption and mistrust and polarization, it's absolutely fundamental and, and definitely contributes to my optimism with the region.